that what keeps coming up in this conversation at the, at the hard edge of the conversation about race is economics that until there is meaningful economic opportunity and that's going to require not that the, the the current system is divided up differently but that it is changed I mean, I, I mean even if you look at and this is the big problem with america you know america if you look about african americans they were taken to America because of slavery, to do labor. That's the point. That's why there's 40 million African-Americans in the country. Slavery ends, you don't need them anymore. You know, there's a boom in this, after the post-war, there's a boom where you need workers and the people are getting, it gets somewhat better. Uh, but that's gone. I mean, look at the way work is going there. Work's just generally gone either to robotics or it's gone uh, to the developing world. That's what's causing these problems in America, is that you actually have 40 million people who the society cannot provide for. It's just not there, not there. Like literally, and they're treated as surplus. So what do you do? What possible steps can you take other than radically rethinking the whole entire, the, the way the economy works? Because I guarantee there aren't enough jobs, well-paying, decent jobs in America for African-Americans to have equality. It doesn't exist. So what do you do? You have to, if you, well, if you accept that, then you have to accept you need to have a radical overhaul. Of yeah. Oh, bloody hell, Kindy. Well, thank you. I suppose like what I get from from this conversation, what I feel like is that uh, collectively, communally, that we need to concretize some r radical ideas so that it's like, so that we know what it is people are discussing. So for, in this conversation, the idea of, of like <laughs> abolition of the police force, abolition of the prison system, meaningful uh, re uh, like because. Like you, like you said, there is a surplus uh, population due to the way that manufacturing industry has changed, and it's yeah, no prizes for guessing who's gonna be the forty million <laughs> that, that that suffer. So like, uh, unless 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 the pinnacle of our achievement is no longer profit, but a, a, an entirely different set of aims, then this problem will continue to instantiate in various forms with the symptoms to some degree addressed but the underlying disease never altered yeah pretty much it sounds terrible doesn't it? i mean i think there's two no, there are two routes through out of it one of them is is the fact again the whole we do really need to rethink capital just generally but if you want to look at psychosis look at the way that even though the world is literally going to end shortly if we don't change, people still don't change. So this is, just tells you how impervious people are <laughs> to this basic facts, right? Um, but the other thing I say is just support the oppressed. I mean, look, there's been centuries of movements of people who are better placed to make the changes that we need. In some ways, like, this is the history of everything. Revolution, revolution is what tips things into a different and you have to say, where is revolution going to occur? Where is it going to come from? It's not going to come from white people in Europe, in America. It's not. Like, it's going to come from the oppressed. And so we should be doing all that we can to support the oppressed to ferment this revolution if that's what we want. That's what I'd say. Right. So at some point, yeah, thanks. So at some point, that's like going to mean that if, if, you know, if not an armed struggle, that's going to be the withdrawal of labour unionizing that like that's where that that will come from like that this like the pla the places that are most exploited the people that are most exploited r recognizing that uh, that they do have power collectively i suppose that's where some sort of global alliance of information and support could take place that you could have yeah an internationalist solution if the if there was you know if the, the where the support went where the focus went was to the to the most exploited, and, and I mean that not in a national sense, but in an international sense, if you think, right, okay, so we've got to support the people that are working. And then, again, you'd straight away be confronted with, oh, no, we're fucking with the interests of some of the most powerful nations and corporate interests in the world. How's this going to play on the 9 o'clock news? These people are terrorists, these people, they're paedophiles, they're raping, <laughs> as soon as you start getting it anywhere near that stuff. I mean, yeah, that is, I mean... That's the other problem is if you look at the, the way that things are controlled now, I mean, it's, it's the next level of control, even in terms of um, the way that things are produced. So it's very rare you have a product that's produced in one place because capital understands if it's produced in one place, you can shut down that place and, it doesn't exist, and then you stop production. Now, I think that's why things are produced in different parts all around the world, because you stop one place and just pick up somewhere else. Um, and then you look at the technologies of surveillance and I mean, look, it's not an easy thing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting here saying it's going to be it's going to be straightforward, but 
at some point, if the, you know, there's what, 7 billion people on the planet, the West, I mean, really only about 2 billion are doing decently. Most people are doing really bad. Like most people in the world don't have a toilet in their house. You know, I think sometimes we forget the scale of the problem. Outside the West is terrible. So if 5 billion people get together and say, this has to end, it will end. It's just, how do you get, how do you get that, that unity and that mobilization? I suppose what you'd need is a few educated and charismatic figures, some international anti-racist Avengers, as it were, one of whom might wear a kimono in a dreadful reappropriation of another culture's <laughs> emblems. <laughs> yeah. No, but, but no, but that's, and that's the other thing is that actually it's ironic because the, te the technology to do the kind of thing that needs to be done is here. Like it's here in a way that it wasn't here previously. Like you can have I've had conversations with just people in random countries, like crazy amount of countries during the lockdown because of this. So in some ways, the system's created the technology for us to have the unity that we need. But because we have the technology, we're less interested in actually having that unity. So it's totally ironic. But actually, the tools are there if we do want to build a genuine international movement. I think that's what, that's what we should all be doing, actually, is if we want to start having these conversations on a global level, it totally changes the nature of the conversation. My sense is that everybody would be happy, happier, if freed from this psychosis, freed from the illusion that minor differences between people were worth elevating, that material privileges and comforts, while of course hugely seductive, if you can free yourself, again with a spirituality, Kahindi, if you can free yourself from the wanting, if you can free yourself from the wanting and needing, like if you can become master of yourself instead of master of others, then you are granted, a now you are free to start thinking, all oh, right, now, now I have a mission, now I have purpose. I mean, I think right, when you think of the sort of nihilism, loss, emptiness, banality of contemporary Western life. You know, what is it you're going to do? Climb some tiny little ladder in whatever chosen field, whether it's a good one or a bad one that you've ended up in, or are you going to be part of something transcendent and glorious? Now, when people start talking that way, Hitler, it always <laughs> it starts it starts getting a little bit shaky, but I still think, I still believe in, I think that somehow you can reach into people, you can reach beyond their, the narrow set of beliefs that we all of us have and awaken something in them that is great. I think that there is a greatness. Yeah, no, it's, it's possible. I don't, I don't want to say it's possible. <laughs> it's possible. I'm trying to wrap up on a high. You've got, you've got to write 20 things tomorrow for Guardian readers to sort their shit out. <laughs> you can't even <laughs> support me in my cockeyed optimism. <laughs> no, look, I, oh, look I, I think that, I get, yeah, I guess that, yeah, that's what I think that is. That's the, yeah, that's the thing, right? Look, there will be revolutionary movements. I think that's probably the route that this changes. Um, I think the message for me would be, look, it will be nice. I think you're probably right. Look, we maybe I'm a bit too pessimistic about the the capacity of people to overcome their material benefits. Um, and I would love to be proved wrong on this. Love to be proved wrong. It'd be great if it happened. But I guess the, the point is that we can't wait for people to get on board. We're just going to do what we're going to do. If you want to get on board, get on board. But if not, hmm. the train's going anyway. And if that train's successful, it's going to overturn the system anyway. And you have to get on board. So... <sighs> I don't see you as pessimistic or optimistic. I see you as authentic, authentic. And, and when you speak, you speak from a place of knowledge and understanding. And I also see you as like kind. That's how I see you, which I think is a good tool to have when you're going around telling people that they are neurotic, <laughs> mentally ill, and everything's got to be dismantled. <laughs> <laughs> you do with a smile on your face people will appreciate it <laughs> he's lovely that guy who says we've got to deconstruct our lovely comfortable house <laughs> <laughs> thank you